on mute. Yeah, I was hoping to just have a short um, discussion about the short-term plan released by um, Clay today. It has some significant impacts on CUDs, and, and one one of the questions is to what extent did we participate in the development of that? Okay, so that that was on the agenda. So we will we will be talking about that. That was that was added. I think that was, Michael, you added that, right? Yeah. Okay. I still have been unable to to drag and drop onto that. Okay. And that. So, so I'm not sure how to give you the file. All right. If you, if why don't you? This is important enough that um, if you wait for me, I can email it to you. I, will, I, I have it. You have it. Okay. Yeah. So just stand by. Okay, it's a long URL. If you want me to actually download that and post the PDF, I can do that too. Otherwise, that was submitted today uh, by Clay Purvis to the uh, Senate Finance Committee. Uh, some very interesting stuff there. I think we'll probably put that towards the end just so you have a chance to read it over and digest it a bit. Um, Alan, could you so, please go on mute? All right, I, I will mute Alan. Um, actually, Alan, while, while, while you are not muted just yet, would you uh, just introduce yourself briefly? We're going to go alphabetically by first name, by um, attendees, just to let Trev know who's who. Sure, I'm Alan Gilbert. I'm from Worcester. I'm the alternate. <clears throat> okay. And Andy. Yep, Andy Gilbert, the delegate from Cabot. Chuck. Chuck Burt, delegate from Moortown. David. Unmute. David Healy from Callis. Frank. Frank Moore uh, from Williamstown, Chief Information Officer at Norwich University. Jared. Uh, excuse me, Jared Thomas, uh, alternate from Cal's. All right, I'm Jeremy Hanson. I'm the chair from Berlin. Uh, Jer the other Jeremy. Hi, I'm Jeremy Matt, uh, alternate from Plainfield and uh, clerk here. Okay, Jerry. Jerry D. M. and TDs, alternate from Berlin, also business development committee. All right, John. Uh, Jonathan Williams from uh, Marshfield. You want to share with us your, your news? Yes, uh, I'm very sorry to say that uh, my wife and I are moving to Berry City from Marshfield, and so I will have to step down as Marshfield's representative, but I hope to continue to support CV Fiber uh, as it uh, seeks to bring high-speed internet to all of Central Vermont. Very much appreciate your work, Jonathan. Congratulations on the move. Thank you. All right, and uh, the other John. He's muted. John Russell, you want, oh, I, I muted him. That's right, I'm going to, there you go. Go ahead, John. <laughs> Once again, it's John Russell from Worcester. That was right. good. Very good. Uh, Josh. Hello, I'm Josh Jarvis. I'm the delegate from Barrytown. All right, Ken? Ken Jones, Montpelier and Business Development Committee. Okay, Lucas? Lucas Herring, alternate from Barry City. I'm also the IT director for the Department of Corrections and the mayor for the city. John, just to know, as the alternate, I probably will not be re-upping as the alternate. So if you're moving to Barry City and would like to be an alternate from Barry City, uh, just consider that. <laughs> I'll definitely consider it. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that, Lucas. Go, go, going in for the kill there. Michael. So I'm, I'm Michael Birnbaum, delegate from Plainfield. All right. Bill. 
Uh, Phil Hayek, delegate from Middlesex and vice chair. Okay. All right, I'm muting John again. Sorry. Uh, let's see, uh, Ray? Yeah, so nice try, Jonathan, trying to get off the committee. He had to move, huh? Okay, <laughs> Ray Pellet here from Northview. All right, Tom? Hi, uh, Tom Fisher, uh, delegate for East Montpelier. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Um, I have a feeling we may be doing that again in the next couple months as we get some other um, some other appointees from other places as well. Um, so um, let's move on to um, talking about Duxbury and like Washington. David has a question. Oh, go ahead, David. You're on mute. Can we reappoint yeah. every April? Uh, yeah, it, it, April or May. I mean, if, if the appointments haven't changed, I mean, I, I, ideally each town is going to be reappointing right around now. Um, but in the absence of specific reappointments, our previous appointments do stand. Okay, thanks. So, it, so that, that's a good question. It would be it would be worth reaching out to each of your individual communities and uh, just asking them to go through the go through the motions of reappointing you as necessary, or uh, if you know that there's somebody else who wants to get involved, then we can, you know, get them ramped up as an alternate. That would be, that would be amazing. Um, or if you feel like you need to be replaced, that's, that's okay too. Um, anything else on, on this with the turnover in the board? Okay. So, um, the, this next one, um, the conversations are still happening mostly outside of this committee. Uh, Duxbury showed some interest. Some uh, residents approached me, somebody on the planning commission, and uh, I was actually on the uh, Duxbury Select Board's uh, agenda last night. And they're actually, I was really straightforward with them. I said, you're not part of our feasibility study. We're not really going to be thinking about you. This first pass is kind of too late for the game. Um, that said, they're still interested. And what they chose to do is they're actually, it looks like they're actually going to try to do a feasibility study of their own to answer a slightly different question, whether getting um, broadband to Duxbury is gonna be best done by them joining us, creating their own with Waterbury or other neighboring uh, towns or contracting in some other way. So they're going after the broadband innovation grant, the third, uh, the third round of them. Um, so I just want to let you know that that request for them to join is probably not super imminent, but will let may likely come down the road. I've also given them um, a lot of advice and a lot of you know, documentation explaining the, the process and everything, and everybody's uh, super friendly and amenable. Um, uh, Siobhan was also, if she was here, I'd let her tell this, but Siobhan was approached by uh, some more folks in Washington, again, and we hear this over and over, someone in Washington wants to have better internet and they've gone to the select board or something and then it just, everything just falls off. So I'm honestly um, not completely sure what the story is there, but there is some interest over in Washington. And then if you look at the, uh, um, actually there was a map that was put out by uh, Clay today too. Let me, I'll actually go and grab that, um, grab that as well. It's actually, it's, it's pretty neat if you, if you haven't seen it already. Um, let me put this right in here. Um, it's just a map of all of the CUDs at present. And he's, he's updating that map apparently day to day so you can see some of the, the southern uh, CUDs filling out a bit. But uh, the thing that struck me as I was looking at this is poor Washington, Corinth, Topsom, Bradford and such um, kind of pinched without a CUD to call their own. So um, no, sure. knowing that, yeah. Um, I was speaking to somebody who is well-placed yesterday. I can't reveal who mm -hmm. I'm And he said that EC is talking to a number of towns about expanding. Good, uh, good. I don't, know if it's act, I don't know if it's true or not, but he, he seemed to think it was very true. And um, he also mentioned that 
our town Roxbury might switch over to them. Okay. All right. Well, I, guess, I mean, I guess that will we'll have to wait and see if they really happen. And but it's good to know it's possible. Yeah, I mean, that would still fulfill, you know, our, our mission of getting people broadband. I mean, if EC Fiber builds it first, you know, <laughs> why not, right? Thank you for that, Michael. I appreciate the, uh, so, the insight so the, there. The towns that were mentioned were those ones you just referred to, like Corinth and West Barley and Bradford and those ones in the corner there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So hopefully we'll see some movement one way or the other. I'm I'm, I'm not sure that that they're going to you know, rise to the top of our you know, feasibility studies. Although, as I understand it, some of the some of the work that Fred did over in Orange uh, did lead into Washington somewhat. Okay. Any other uh, thoughts or commentary on um, other towns, Duxbury, Washington, or otherwise? Okay. Um, let's go on to. Treasurer update and accounts payable. Um, so I sent out an email uh, not terribly long ago with an invoice from Fred um, in the amount of, if I can pop back into my own email here. A total amount of $14,736.47. Um, and what I wanted to do is um, I will move that we um, pay our accounts payable in the amount of $14,736.47 um, per the contract that we signed with Interisle. Second. second. Okay. So I saw a second from David. Uh, any further discussion? Um, one thing that I will add is that um, I we will likely be able to take uh, get a good portion of this uh, in reimbursement from our USDA grant. Um, I will need some additional documentation. Um, I will need to put together some additional documentation. That's a that's a me job, um, and possibly a future treasurer job uh, as well. Uh, two different people. Um, I'm still in sort of gr grading mode at the moment. Once I come up for air. I have meetings with, uh, or I have conversations to have with two different treasurer candidates. Um, one lives in Orange, one lives in Moortown. So I'll, I'm gonna have these conversations uh, probably Thursday, Friday. I also have a meeting with um, um, Nathan to sort of wrap things up and sort of talk about transition plans for um, the uh, fundraising platform for the VSCCU bank account and such. Um, Jeremy, did you get a chance to follow up with the candidate I sent you from Barry City? Uh, okay, so so I, I said I said more town, yes. So I. Oh, okay, okay, that, that was the more town version. Yeah, more town, yes, yes. I was. That's yeah. That's what I was thinking. Okay. But yes, from Barry City instead. So no, yeah, I, I was exchanging some messages, and I I do have a meeting, uh, phone meeting with her, uh, whenever I call her again on Thursday, I think it is. Um, real quick question: What is Nathan's last name? Hoke, H O C K. So the uh, motion on the floor um, was to essentially pay pay our bills for our consultant. Any further discussion on that? Okay. Um, hearing none, so that we don't have to do the. Um, and I'm going to unmute. Um, I'm gonna unmute John for a moment here. And John, John, is it possible for you to mute yourself so I don't have to force mute you? Uh, yes, of course, if you're speaking okay. to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, just getting a lot of background noise from your line. Um, all right, so I'm going to assume that we have consensus on paying the bill in the amount of uh, $14,736.47, unless I hear otherwise. Okay, hearing no objections, I will take that as uh, unanimous consent and the motion passes. Um, any other discussion about uh, accounts payable or otherwise? Okay, 
All right, let's move on to um, the joint CUD letter to the to RUS and the federal delegation. This is something that I've been working on with Evan Carlson from the Northeast Kingdom and some of the folks up there. Um, and we, in addition to uh, Laura Sibilia from the, uh, uh, the House Energy and Technology Committee, have been talking about the wisdom of essentially all lining up together and uh, essentially presenting a, a unified front and saying we want to kind of defend our we want to defend the funding we want it to go in a sensible direction and we want to make sure that people actually get um broadband out of it so the uh, the title that we have on the kind of the working copy that we're going through right now is a letter of support for prioritization of funding for cuds and this is um you know talking about some of the past funding decisions that have been made at the federal level, um, some of the upcoming funding that's coming. And the idea is to at least get out there and be um, a, almost like almost a statewide push to say, here's, here's why we think our model is gonna work and why, and why we think that you know, certain funding should be preserved for us, not for parties who will remain nameless, but who have previously not essentially um it's not paid off i mean the federal investment has you know made some moderate moves forward but have not kind of scratched that itch of universal coverage so i'm i'm happy to um send that to everybody um uh when we're done with it we're still kind of plowing through um bits and pieces here and i don't know that i necessarily need a, a motion from everybody if you are willing to um to trust me with with the wording and uh put the power of the board behind it i would happily hear a, a motion to that otherwise i will write it as just simply as chair as myself as a position statement which is something that you uh, the board has previously authorized the chair to do um if there's something that you think needs to be mentioned in there let me know I'm not I'm not terribly interested, sorry, I'm not terribly interested in having a hundred cooks in the kitchen and giving you access and having you wordsmith this with me. Um, I've worked on enough academic projects to know that uh, that just doesn't work. If you have suggestions, ideas, please send them my way. I will do my best to incorporate them and I will send you the final product, which I'm sure will be horribly, terribly flawed and just miserable and you know not meeting anybody's requirements or whatever but if you have things that you think that we need to mention let me know um what's your preference would you like the board to sort of endorse this this letter or get behind it i mean i can again i would like to go ahead and make a motion that the board stand by this letter okay i hear a motion i would like to see the letter before we endorse it okay well that's what i'm i'm unfortunately <laughs> I, I was working on a little bit more today. Um, and, and again, if you did see the letter, it would not be changeable because we're what we're trying to do is we're trying to get a letter that's going in front of the kingdom, that's going to the other CUDs, EC Fiber, and getting everyone to say, yes, we, we're gonna co-sign this. So I'm gonna either sign it as chair or I will sign it as the whole board. So um, I think, I thought I heard David seconding this. Is that right, David? Okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, it's seconded. Can we have discussion now? Yep, that's what I'm. That's what I'm hoping to have right now. Okay. Um, who, remind me again. Who is it addressed to? It is addressed to, um, um, our U.S. and our federal delegation, and uh, if I presume presume is going to be passed along to the FCC as well. So essentially the the various funding spigots for broadband jeremy what is rus rural utility service which i believe there i mean so that was uh that, that was just what i happened to put this on the agenda on the agenda as because that was the subject line of an email um that laura sibilia had sent but there's yeah there's kind of a broader audience here as well what's the uh, Go ahead, Ray, if you want. Yeah, so Jerry, does this say we need $100 million and uh, CB Fiber needs 
15 million, everybody needs whatever, and the timing of the flow of the money, what, what's the purpose of the letter? No, the purpose of the letter is, hey, there's all of this federal funding, there's all this various sort of funding out there. We yeah. want you to think real hard about where you're putting it and think about previous actual performance. And even though we're an untested entity, we are yeah. gonna follow this pattern of actually delivering on 100% coverage in the footsteps of EC Fiber. So this is Ken, you know, we have to recognize that a reason for this letter is to make it harder for RUS to give VTEL money. VTEL is applied for money through RUS. Laura Sibelia hates VTEL with a passion. Um, and so that's a reason that she's behind it. So, you know, A, I'm not sure how effective it is. This is a program that RUS runs. Um, I, I just, I wish there was a better way of understanding the role of VTEL. Um, but that, let's be clear that that is the intent of the letter. What? Is there any other, any other groups that are going to be uh, cut out of this that we want to make sure are cut out of it? Like Comcast and others? So, but we're not, we're not naming anyone. The idea here is that we're saying we have this model that's, you know, heretofore worked that we're trying to duplicate and we think is going to get to a hundred percent coverage more cheaply and uh, with better governance and better accountability than any other solution out there. We are explicitly not saying, don't go here. We are yes. writing as a positive, we have this, we are doing this the right way, fund us instead. And again, and I think Ken's right, do, does this actually change anything? I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, um, it's uh, Evan did an incredible amount of work on it over the weekend. Um, I'm going and sort of, doing more polishing and adding some parts that he um, um, kind of left blank. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's, it's an opportunity to essentially be a, a unified front. I mean, with, uh, I think a combination of, with all the CDs, 88 towns, which is a non-trivial number of, you know, a chunk of that, Vermont. It's, that process and objective work for me. Okay. Andy, you had something? Yeah, I was just going to get at the, you know, what's, does it matter whether you're doing it as the chair or as the board? I don't, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable either way. And I, you know, and what you just said with Evan, having put a lot of work into it and knowing Evan too. So I, yeah, and the general outline you gave it, I'm, I'm good. So I, but I don't know, does it, if it matters semantically that you sign it as chair or as the board? Okay. I don't know. Could I make another comment? Okay. Jeremy, could I make another comment? Yeah, go ahead, Michael. My, my okay. internet connection. Uh, of course. So uh, this feeds into a long-term conflict at the federal level between municipals and the private sector. It's um, the lobbyists have been fighting about it for a long time, and. Um, I don't have a position on it. I, I think it's great that we, I think the unified front is a really good thing. I think we should do a lot of things together. Um, I think uh, I think addressing our congressional delegation is a really good idea. I'm not sure addressing USDA and FCC and NTIA of the Department of Commerce. Those are the entities that dole out money for broadband, I don't know that that will be productive because they work in a, in a different way than accepting letters from interested parties. They, they, they have notices of proposed rulemaking and then there's ex parte discussions that all have to be posted publicly. And, and this whole legal process, I'm not, I'm not understanding how this works into that, but I, I think telling our congressional delegation that we want you to prioritize CUDs, I think that's a great idea. And I think everyone being together, it's a great idea. And particularly since Peter Welch is um, one of the principals on the Rural Broadband Caucus in the, in the House, um, he, has, he can use that to great effect, I think. So I, I, I like the idea in general. I'm not sure the targeted audience is exactly right. So that's my comment. 
and I haven't seen what it says. I'm sure it's well done, but it's always good to see something we're endorsing. Sure. Yeah, and I'm I'm aware at a very high level of the sort of flunky mechanisms of those large federal bureaucracies, and I have no interest right now and of no ability to engage in that process at all. So, um, you know, is it just a, you know, is it the, the right way to engage in that, um, you know, in that bureaucracy? Yeah, almost certainly not. Um, but on the other hand, uh, we'll, set, we'll send it out, you know, do the, op the open letter sort of thing and, uh, you know, get it to, you know, Welch, Sanders, and Leahy. And if they have a way to sort of press buttons in a more effective way, that's, they that's fine. And they, but they, we'll, they can go through the back door at RUS and talk. But, but for us to address it directly, I'm not sure that's effective. Okay, well, it's, but it's going to go to everyone. It's going to be a, a statement of like, hey, here's, here's us, you know, this, and it's going to the delegation and to those places. And if it just gets, you know, circular bin, that's fine. That's whatever. So, Michael, do you think that it is uh, going to be in any way counterproductive to send it to those entities? Um, it's, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't assert that, but it's possible, yeah, because the, because there's a legal process for talking to those, those entities, and um, we just have to know how we're doing it. Usually there's a lot of lawyers and lobbyists involved, and we're trying to do something sort of an end run around it, which, which is always cool. Um, it's just, you, you need to know the game there. It's really different there than the Vermont legislature and departments in Vermont. And I, I, I have a bit of experience with it and it's, it's, you have to have, you have to have organization behind you to, to follow up and, and make things work there. Um, you know, send it. I, I'm not, a, I'm not against sending it. I'm just questioning how effective it might be other than urging our congressional delegation to do good work for us. Jeremy, could I raise a question? Of course. Have you talked to Phil Sussman and at all about this? No, I haven't gotten on, on Phil's radar. I have a, honestly, almost as direct of a connection to, to Leahy as Phil. If okay, that's, but if that's what you're getting at. No, but the thing I'm I'm thinking about, I this is the third institution in which I've been a CIO, and I can't believe the millions in federal dollars we've gotten from the feds. I've never been at an institution that's done that before. And Phil walks out the door and he rolls in with checks. I don't know how he does it. And and you know, it may be just worth five minutes to bend his ear. You may not get anything, but you may be surprised. Okay. Yeah, I would like to if if we could maybe set up a time in the next um, next few days to to have an offline conversation about this. Frank, it wouldn't be a waste of time. We may get nothing, but we may be surprised. I mean, I mean, I would personally like to talk to you, just you and me. All right, we could do that at first. I th I think that would be helpful. Jeremy, does this have any value with the state legislature? Uh, yes, the state legis. I mean, so at least the the House committee that's that's part of this conversation. They're they're aware of this effort. So yes, very much so. Okay. Um, so the, there remains a, a motion to um, for the entire board to support this this letter to RUS and the federal mm -hmm. delegation. Uh, any further discussion? Okay. Hearing none, I will assume that we have unanimous consent unless I hear otherwise. Okay. Hearing no objections, I'm assuming that the motion passes unanimously. 
thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Um, once I finish that letter with Evan in the next few days, he's going to get it in front of his board. We have it. Um, uh, in, we'll have it in front of the other CUDs by the end of the week, and I expect that they'll be approving it in some capacity um, by next week. We're hope, we're sh kind of shooting for um, Monday, I believe was the was what what, we're, what our target date was. Okay, um, moving on. We will see this letter. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. When it's when I'm when it's done, when it's done being drafted and all that, every everybody's going to see it. It's going to be an open letter. Um, all right, let's move on to the um, approval of the minutes. Has everyone had a chance to review Jeremy's minutes that were he sent out uh, today and quite a bit earlier last week, I believe? So if you're, if whatever reason you don't feel comfortable reviewing this just yet. We we are not obliged to approve it necessarily right now. If you wanted to hold off, we can do that. Otherwise, if you want to do a quick eyeballs over it. Could these be approved on the ninth? Of course. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to read them over carefully first. Okay, I hear that as a motion from Frank to table that, table this item until the ninth. Is there a second? Second. Okay, I heard a second from Michael. Any further discussion on tabling this to the ninth, or would folks just rather vote it out now? Okay, not everybody wants to choose. Okay, so I'm, go I'm going to assume we have unanimous consent to postpone this to the 9th. Minutes to May 9th. Um, I will assume that we have unanimous consent unless I hear otherwise. Hearing no objections, I believe that we have uh, unanimous approval on this and the motion passes. The uh, approval of the minutes will be, uh, uh, we'll handle that at our regularly scheduled meeting on May 9th. Um, okay, got that done. Um, Michael, David, do you know if Fred is joining us? Uh, actually, sorry, just to call something out, I think our next regularly scheduled meeting is gonna be May 12th, as May 9th is a Saturday. Oh, yeah, I don't wanna meet on a Saturday. <clears throat> Nor do I. Okay, so I'm going to uh, just exert executive privilege and sort of retroactively change that motion to say the 12th. So, I mean, unless you want to do a Saturday, Saturdays can be nice. Maybe it'll be sunny. We can do this outdoors. Yeah, no, no, that's silly. Okay. Okay, um, so that's done May 12th. Attention to detail, Chuck. That's what I love about you. All right. Um, so the question again to uh, David or Michael or business development project committee folks, any um, any knowledge about whether we are going to have Fred? Oh, I see Greg just joined us. Let me add him as a panelist. Is Fred going to join us to talk about the feasibility study? You made the request and I don't remember seeing a reply. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I, thought he had the information and I, yeah, I didn't see a reply either. Um, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go back and hold on one second. What I would like to do is. Did he possibly fall victim to the same hyperlink issue that uh, was in the first email? I, uh, it's possible, but I didn't see, um, I didn't see any sort of cries for help. Okay. Um, what I want to do though is I'm going to send a copy. Now this is all something that um, would have been sent out as part of the contract with Interisle. I'm just going to post this here for um, for our own review. Um, 
in the in the chat. Oh wow, okay, that's not gonna work. Let me I'll put it as a text file. Let's see, contract scope. So there's been some discussions about um what interisle ought to or ought not to be doing. And where, okay, so, so I saved it and then it disappeared. Lovely. All right, stand by, there we go, contract scope. And so what, um, what I'm hoping that we can do is if we're, if we're talking about the, the work that they're doing, I'm, um, okay, so you can't, can't put a text file in it. They don't like text files. Okay, can we put it in a Word document? Or maybe um, print it because PDF there were some and post that. Yeah, that's possible. I'm gonna try the Word doc first. Um, there was some discussion about what they should be doing and what we should be seeing. And unfortunately, there was a lot of it that was just not part of what we asked them to do. So um, contract scope. So I just want to make sure that we're all working from the same, the same place. And all right, contract scope. Can we get it there? There we go, uploading. So when we talk about what was supposed to be in the feasibility study, we asked for a certain specific set of things. And that's in that contract scope right there. That's literally just copied and pasted out of, out of the contract. There's a lot of stuff that would be nice to have, of course, but it is, that is simply not in there. Um, the questions about money, for example, like, well, where are the financial projections? Financial projections are not, at least at any sort of detail level, are not part of the feasibility study. Those come in as part of the, the business plan that they will work on once the feasibility study is done. That's a more detailed dive that is the, the second chunk of the broadband, broadband innovation grant funds. So um, the copy of the feasibility study that I sent you, and I think I explained this, um, um, I think I explained this, that it was ex very preliminary, that the current process right now was for that um, was for that draft to then go to the the kind of the project committee business development committee for them to review and give some feedback to Fred and for Fred to incorporate those changes and then make the final the final touches and include some data and things that um, were simply not in there. That meeting happened. Um, you know that review was was done. That feedback was sent to Fred. Fred will be putting the feasibility study, the final feasibility study together in the next, uh, David, help me on the timeline, week? The next week, yes, that's what he told me. Okay, so we will have you know a feasibility study in front. Go ahead. He was finishing up the remote area analysis that he had done at all in the previous version. Okay, so, while we could say, you know, it would be nice to see this or that in there, realistically, you know, they can be contracted for some work already. And there is, while there is a bit of, you know, kind of Q&A back and forth that we can add to this, we can't really ask them to do any sort of substantially different work than what we contracted for. So I just want everybody to be clear about that. Go ahead, David. We did, the, the committee, you know, when we met with them and we met separately with us, we all had our comments and we consolidated all our comments and sent it back to Fred. So they're pretty extensive comments for those who had already looked at the preliminary draft there. Um, I mean, he left out some significant chunks that we were expecting to see and um, added more that we didn't expect to see. But in any event, he did get a lot of comments from us and hopefully they'll be addressed in the version we get back. Oh, the, the the point I'd like to make, um, you know, just on the topic, of financials, um, 
the scope did include pro forma financial projections as the third to last item. And, and so, you know, obviously that can be left up to interpretation as to just how detailed that expectation might be since it doesn't explicitly call out, does this include, you know, three years worth of potential OPEX responding specifically to Andy's uh, comments that he passed around. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I do think there, there, it, if we're going to get to three years worth of projection to show cash flow positive, there does have to be some amount of that that's done at the feasibility phase ahead of even a, a much more detailed business plan where you likely would get into, well, what aspect of it is marketing spend versus OPEX and yada, yada, yada. More sure. down to like a P&L level detail. But Chuck just said exactly what I was going to say. Um, and we do have an understanding with Fred that that will be done. Um, so there are financials coming. It's just not going to be, you know, deeply detailed, but enough, enough to, I mean, we have to assert to the Department of Public Service that this project is feasible and they have to look at it and feel comfortable with that report and say, yep, you can proceed. And so, it's a requirement. He has to get pro formas in there that show three year feasibility. Well, actually, the three years was for Vita, wasn't it? Or no, it was for the department. So no, it's the way I said it the first time. Yeah, so I think I think the question there is level of comfort around uh, financial modeling done from a top, top down perspective versus a bottom up perspective. Um, obviously, when you're getting to a business plan, you want more bottom up modeling, uh, but for, for pro pro forma, we probably need to be comfortable with top down and and live with the fact that once bottom up is done, there's likely going to be differences and things that were missed and, and so forth. Yeah, and I'd also like to point out that uh, we still have uh, you know, Stan on the hook from ValleyNet, who's agreed to do a lot of that work for us when we get to that point. So when the feasibility study is done, um, I'm expecting that, you know, uh, we're we're going to have some of those more um, realistic, specific costs. You know what are what are EC Fiber's operating expenses? He can tell you exactly down to the cent. So yeah, we should have a pretty good uh, we should have a pretty good answer after we kind of yeah, big picture know what what's possible. Um, so uh, David or Michael, would you would you be willing to kind of tell the rest of the board what our next steps are? I mean, in terms of the feasibility study, business plan, Fred, and such. Well, the the uh, we were hoping that tonight would be the presentation of Fred to the board of the plan based on our review. So we we obviously still have to do that. <clears throat> um, I saw, uh, you know, at the next meeting we'll have Fred formally present the feasibility study, and you know, from what our work with him thus far, it looks, you know, we we basically. He came up he, for those who have read the preliminary feasibility study. You saw that he's come up with what he thought was the best pilot area, and then he's got five other routes that he's developed. And one of the major things we asked him to change was the name of the routes. So right now they're all going to be called colors. There's going to be a blue route, an orange route, a yellow route, a green route, and a salmon colored route because all the routes go through multiple towns in some degree or another. So we decided that was the easiest way to, to, to refute the well, who's getting what first. Uh, not quite anyway. But. And he based the, the pilot project pretty much on the density of um, structures, premises on a road, and not on, I mean, if you're thing, not on, not on cable. So that's how those routes were developed. And we, we sort of went along with that. We, we're giving him a, you know, the leeway to make those recommendations because we certainly weren't capable of doing that. Um, in terms of what else we hope to see, he's supposedly doing a radio study on where the areas that he can't reach or doesn't think are easy to reach because of its low densities. And then come back with, I know he's doing numbers <clears throat> on take rates, take rates because one of the things that was missing in the well, uh, the preliminary version was, I mean, he had all the semi, uh, survey data and he had, even though that's, you know, not perfect survey, 
there's some good sense of um, what what we thought people were willing to, to pay for. So he's going to do multiple, I, I think, a 50 or 60 percent take rate over time on the, the routes he's, he's proposing to see whether they work out the, the cash flow piece. Um, Michael, what else is he going to come back with? Do you remember? Um, nothing's jumping out right now. Covered pretty well. The other thing I've done for those who didn't know, who weren't on the committee, um, I have taken the roots and put them into my ArcGIS software and made them a lot more pretty. Plus, I've done some work that they didn't. I mean, they may have been doing it, but I've been the junkie that I am. I've summarized all the structures, the premises by this, the current level of service offered. And that'll be in. Hopefully, they'll put that in the report. Um, but I David, what, what is the data source on that? Is that self-reported by the current ISPs? Because uh, you yeah. know, I have consolidated, and they're supposed to be doing ten one and three three down seven sixty eight kilobit. The best I can buy. Well, we have to use whatever data the department put out. And yeah, uh, in this case, I mean the the Moortown Middlesex Worcester route. There's a lot of underserved. 33% of the properties are underserved on that route, which means they don't even have 4 1. So um, I'm feeling like they probably did a pretty good job of picking a route. And I think when we get down to it, you can't, I mean, I, the department was very loath to release that data. <laughs> and, you know, right now it's sort of a critical piece of how we work. And so I was happy that they did that. They did that in the course. Actually, they did it under a little bit of pressure from CV Fiber because um, we needed to know where to go. And um, so I feel good about that. But Fred is to ask a question. Um, yes, that's that's speeds as reported by yeah. providers, not verified by the department. Right. However, they, they did put out a, a map that you can click on each residence and you can actually complete a survey by address so that right. Chuck, if you're, if they're reporting a particular speed, you can click on your address and you can say, nope. I just so, pasted a link to that in the chat. Oh, awesome. thank, thank you very you. much. Jeremy, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to make sure that that's visible to the entire audience. Yep. Off we Let's go. As a, uh, as a survey method, the, this is Tom Fisher. Um, that was, it, I would have very little expectation of lots of people being able to find their way through that and get to the survey and fill it out. It was not straightforward at all. I agree. So, yeah, so Senate, in Senate Finance Committee today, they actually, um, folks from DPS were actually, you know, imploring the legislature, the individual legislators to say, if you're hearing from a constituent that doesn't have service or you want to advertise this, have them click on their house here and, and take that survey because that's information then that DPS can then take and give to us. And that we could, you know, we or other CUDs can then act upon that. If we know somebody isn't happy, if we know somebody doesn't have service when there is service reported, um, that's, you know, a, that's an opportunity for CUDs to uh, fix that, I think. It is, I'm just um, saying that we may, have, may end up with a bit of a bias on, on the results we get back. Oh, sure, sure. I'm sure that's the case. Um, so I, I, have, I have a question about the timeline with the project and whatever in terms of going from the feasibility study to the business plan. Um, there's, a, there's some point where we should probably decide where our pilot is going to be so that when we go and do the business plan, we actually have a concrete number of, well, how many poles? You know, not the engineering level, but th so that we have an understanding that if we do choose the the westerly route or the maroon route or the green route or whatever it happens to be that we have some uh, a lot more concrete numbers to put in front of Vita. When are we as the board going to be making that decision in your in your eyes, David? In my eyes or in the team's? <laughs> I, sure, I think whatever. The, the consensus, at least my point of view, is they did their, you know, the, the nitty gritty of their work is done on the pilot that they thought was the best pilot. Um, if we want to, you know, take issue with that, that's fine, I think. But the data that they 
him and they did all their financial work so far on those route on that route based on the poles and the, the train and, and the need for whatever hardware they need to put for I don't know the technical terms on any of these things where they have to connect to the velcro fiber to another box and put it in a cabinet someplace um, I, I assume they could probably you know quickly redo that for some other well I mean not quickly but could do it for another route my my one i mean and we're going to get to this today we may be ending up doing more than one route anyway that um, was my my follow-up and my my feeling is that they've picked six pretty good routes um they probably you know probably could use some input more from the board on what else they ought to look at maybe we use seventh route because there's some middle mile middle areas in there that didn't get too much coverage um but uh from the most part you know, I was pretty, I was pretty happy with what they could come up with in terms of coverage and connectivity. Michael, do you have anything yeah, to add to that? I'd like to add to that. Um, so they, they actually did not do all the data for the Middlesex, Worcester, Moorestown route. What they did was they did a little a section of it that they could do in depth. And then they extrapolated from that what it might might cost to do, and they used the same data for all the other areas as well. So there's there's a proposed pilot, and there was also the sample area that they used as as a quick way to extrapolate costs everywhere. Um, and I think the final report will have a comparison of them all. I, I hope so. I would think they've done enough work to do that. Yeah. Um, and what, one other thing about the cost in the in the in the draft, the partial draft that got circulated, you saw some numbers like 1.6 million or 1.7 million. Those were not complete figures. Those were figures for a certain portion of the cost of doing that. They left out such things as make ready and engineering. And then there's OPEX. So there's a there's a number of other things that will appear in the in the completed feasibility study that will really change what we saw. And um, we told them to make their best guess as to what would be the best choice to meet the objectives the department and Vita put out for us. And we told them, don't choose the ones where we live, choose the ones you think are the best. We, as a board, can overrule them. We can say, you know, we'd rather it goes to Orange than it goes to Worcester. We can do that. But we hired them to, to give us their best judgment. And so we'll have to have pretty good reasons, I would think, to overrule their suggestion. But I agree with Jeremy and David. Um, it's possible we'd be able to do two or one and a half of them. And then when we get around to this other discussion of what came up today from the department, there may be other money. So we may be able, be able to do a beta funded thing and a grant funded thing and an RDOF funded. There's all these different possibilities. We may be able to get farther than we expected, earlier than we expected. This is Jerry, if I could just add to that uh, a little bit. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, yes. great, thanks. Yeah, I, you know, my takeaway from this, regardless of where the first implementation takes place, is that we do have a feasible situation. Uh, you know, the numbers aren't finalized and we don't know exactly what the take rates are. But if you, if you take a 20,000 foot perspective on what Inter Isle has done and what David's surveys are telling us, it, it looks like we have something that's implementable. And a lot of what we do next is going to be, depend on whether the money that we're using are grants or loans. And I think we need to be prepared for the bigger picture. Um, you know, it's 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 when we were looking at figuring that we needed a loan and we you know we needed three years to be able to cover expenses, et cetera. But 
I, I think it would be a very good thing if we were also, on the other hand, feeling ready to take all of what they've presented as phase one um, under the possibility of getting you know, big grant money. It may be out there. Which I think is, a, is probably a, a logical place now to a segue to the, the DPS proposal that just that came out today that was in front of Senate Finance. Because um, as, if I could boil it down, one of the major suggestions there was that the state of Vermont take um, various pools of money, one of them, you know, the uh, stimulus funding that came directly to the states, and essentially establish something like a reverse auction, an RDOF style reverse auction for every town in Vermont and giving the uh, CUD's authority over any towns in their district. So they would essentially establish um, subsidies for all of those places and all of those towns where RDOF doesn't have a footprint. So it would not conflict with RDOF funding. So any place on the map that you saw that there was an RDOF shaded area, we would be able to go after potentially we'd be able to go after state of Vermont reverse auction funding in the same sort of way. Um, there was also talk in there about uh, providing, having the Vermont provide that letter of credit uh, required for CUDs and such to go after the RDOF money as well, which is super, super exciting because um, that really opens up a lot of doors for us. Um, and you know, so, something I, you know, I communicated to folks on the, on the committee separate from that meeting is I said, you, that there was a question about, well, you know, are the, you know, are the CUDs able to, you know, go at bigger projects? Are they able to take a, you know, a bigger bite? And, and my response was, you know, we're looking at a $4 million pilot because that's the, that's the size of the pot of money that was offered from VDA. Now, what if we had a, a twenty million, you know, dollar pot to work from. Could we make? Could we have a pilot project that's five times larger? I said yes. Um, you know, is it going to take longer to physically build out? Sure. Is it going to be more complicated to engineer? Sure. But there's, I think, there's a lot of value to building that bigger project. You, your network design, I think, is going to be better. Um, I think it's going to be cheaper overall rather than taking, you know, five separate bites at the apple. So, I mean, I think there's some interesting things afoot and the Senate Finance Committee and the folks from DPS who were, you know, uh, who were in that meeting were like thinking like how, not, not whether this is a good idea, but how we can move forward, how we can make this work. I mean, obviously devils and details and such, and they, and they acknowledge that, but this was like, it, it was it was kind of strange because this was the one of the first times that it sounded like you know people at the state were were willing to actually write checks and actually subsidize the construction of broadband in Vermont, which which has happened in you know drips and drabs, but not not, not like this. I mean, if you look at the um, if you look at that link that I posted, you know Clay is talking about you know ninety ninety million dollars to two hundred and change million dollars of subsidies to build um, to build 100 100 symmetric broadband everywhere in Vermont where there's not already 25 three so anywhere where you have cable and better we're essentially just gonna forget about those areas right now anywhere that's not cabled we're gonna talk about building fiber that was their thrust that was the pitch and to me that was super exciting what do you got Ray uh, my question is do we need to lock up valley net early before somebody else perhaps gets them as a partner to possibly um, uh, you know, get started earlier and build something this big? Is there any other partner we could have in which we could take on $10 million project? Wait, no, there's no. others. Uh, no, other? no, I sent out the request this week to five ISPs, ValleyNet, Telco, Waitsfield, um, Champlain Telecom and Val, um, RV Technologies, Cloud Alliance, and um, VTEL. What's and, our timeline for all that, David? Pardon me? 
What's our timeline for all of that? I told them May 10th. I wanted to get a reply back to let an interest by May 10th. So far, I get a reply from uh, Vito, an email from Vito. So I just want to add yourself. another another element in that um, proposal today, which I, I thought was a little scary, and that is they also want to establish a fund for cable line extension, and so that sets up a competition. Um, it's not clear. Certainly, it was a very brief proposal, but that's also opens the door for Comcast in our area to say, okay, you're going to put up a fund there, and I just don't know how we consider competition. Um, yeah, yeah, that was that was interesting. If I understood that correctly, Ken, that was only to accelerate cable line extensions that Comcast is already required to do under agreements regarding some penalties they they sustain and so that's going to happen it's just going to happen faster if they can make it happen there's they're not they, about funding okay. other. I, I read it as they were establishing a fund to do that, that, that yeah, was... it was to help comcast meet its its obligations early so they would subsidize comcast to some extent to meet that obligation early yeah, but then Clay gave an example of there are citizens who want an extension, a connection to Comcast who are a thousand feet away, and Comcast wants to charge a lot of money. This fund would fund that individual to get the money to pay Comcast to extend it to them. That's what I heard Clay say later in the meeting. Anyway, we should probably keep going. <laughs> um, there, was so, a map, there was a map that Clay showed distributing all the money to all the towns and I don't know, did you send that out to everybody? I'll, I'll put it up right now. Hold on. Anyway, the, the money ranged in our in CV, CV5 is territory. Callis was 2.29 million. Worcester was a million. Middlesex was 1.8 million. Moortown was 0.84 million. Northfield was 2.38 million. Orange was 2 million. Plainfield was one and a quarter million. So they're talking about a lot of money. If we, if we lump some of those together, couldn't we <laughs> theoretically fund a lot of the portions of those routes that we're looking at? Absolutely, but, yes. but you need yep. to understand this is still just a theory. They don't have the cash. <laughs> the plan is that maybe they'll, they, they almost said it in the meeting, maybe they'll get the <laughs> governor and the legislature to agree to use some of the one and a quarter billion they're sitting on right now. But of course, the state colleges are looking for that money. Everybody's looking for that money. So there's going to be a big battle. So some of that money may come from there. Some of that money may come from FEMA when they do disaster relief later. Some of it may come from a broadband infrastructure bill from, from the feds. They don't know where the money is coming from yet. But this is what this is a nearly fleshed out plan. It'll be out on 5th of May, I guess, so very soon. So that when the money is available, they know exactly what to do with it. Right. But that, but they can't. They're not giving us anything yet. They're giving us a really good plan, and let's hope it works out. But where do they come up with the estimates? Where, where, where do the numbers come from? From the Magellan report to the utilities. Magellan studied um, what it would cost to to get fiber to every um, underserved location in the state. And they're using those numbers, and they're they're high, and yeah. so the reverse auction will end up reducing these numbers. the The total for the state is two hundred ninety three million bucks, and you know there'll there'll be a competition. We'll bid, you know, the CD Fiber might bid for our eighteen towns, and Consolidated or someone else might bid against us, and then it's going to go to the lowest bidder, and so the number will go lower. That's a reverse auction. That's the way it works. It's the same way RDOF does this work. But but again, that it would require a hundred hundred symmetric, and then there would be the. Uh, I mean, if it's run the same way as RDOF, fiber is essentially top tier, and if consolidated or whoever is not offering to build fiber, 
then that's not going to be, it, it won't even be competed with. They won't be allowed to bid because this right. plan only talks about 100-100. Right. There isn't, there's no 25 free category. Right. Okay. Out of curiosity, what do they mean by the CUDs will have authority over their areas? That, that seemed like an odd phrase to me. Uh, so let's see, uh, it's in 1F under long-term broadband deployment measures, grants, communications, union districts, decision-making authority over grants made within their borders. So um, right of first refusal, perhaps, or, um, you know, if, or we get, or they delegate authority for us to decide who gets the grants in our, in our district, which seems kind of silly, conflict of interest, incestuous, or something like that, if that's what they mean, but yeah, it, it, would, it would be good to have a bit of clarity of what that exactly means. My interpretation of that, and this certainly could be mistaken, um, was that if towns tried to roll out their own program, an existing CUD that covers that town would be granted authority over that town's individual attempt. But again, uh, it, it's a little bit loose, so I, I don't know. Okay. I was wondering if the money has to be spent in that town or if a CUD has money from six different towns or more, if they can say, oh, I'm actually going to not spend it all necessarily in those towns as allocated or if that's actually required. It's no, the, this, this is paying for service in those towns. There's an expectation that if you take that money, you're going to provide service to uh, ev everybody that fits, that fills that requirement. And please, if, if RDOF is something different, Michael, they did say they wanted to mirror that. So some somebody please correct me if I'm that's, misinterpreting that's exactly, that. The only difference is in RDOF, it's um, census block groups, but you can't spread it to some other census block group. It, Whatever you bid on, you have to build in that area and you have to serve, in RDOF, you have to serve every location, even the ones that aren't underserved. The state wasn't saying that. They were saying you only have to serve the underserved, which is more liberal. However, since they're scattered all over the place, you tend to have to overbuild some other stuff to get there. And so there will be a bunch of overbuilding involved. And, and one thing I was thinking about during the hearing was, I can't wait for the Comcast attorneys to get a hold of this. <laughs> oh, they'll be all over. <laughs> okay, anything else that folks want to talk about with this uh, DPS proposal? Well, I, and I, I'll just t take the last word then. I mean, I, I think it's a, I, I think it's exciting, terrible that it that it took something like the pandemic to kind of push this forward. But um, at least everybody's taking it seriously and seeing, you know, actual real broadband as something that's as important as, you know, electricity or water nowadays. So good to finally see some movement on that front, anyways. So I apologize okay. to move back to the prior topic, but um, just uh, in terms of the next steps on that topic, I was coming away a little bit unclear as to what, what we intend to do about the feasibility study. Are we simply just going to invite Fred to come to the May 12th meeting instead and, and hope the presentation happens then? Well, we'll tell him we expect the presentation to happen then. I mean, he's, he's a week or so behind at this point. I mean, kind of makes sense, you know, with every, everything in, Kind of topsy turvy, um, and the folks that you know, the folks that are funding our broad, broadband innovation grant have already said we understand that you need more flexibility with your timeline. So just be, you know, uh, we'll we'll be flexible with you. So okay. I'm happy to be a bit flexible with with Fred as well in this case. But I think, I think yeah, I think we're expecting to see final feasibility on the 12th. Then I'm hoping the. Business Development Committee sees it sooner than that, so we can. Well, you you, you better. <laughs> yeah. Well, because that that was that was part of the process. That was part of the expected right. we're, sequence. We're expecting it. Okay. Um. So uh, I think we're out of agenda items. Then does anybody else have? Um, oh, David, anything else on this? Yeah, I had a conversation today. I've been working on the. Uh, 
Northern Border Regional Commission application and learning lots of things that we have to submit to get that money. And one of the things was making sure that the application was consistent with the regional plan. So I talked to Bonnie Wanaga today, pretty long, that was the reason I talked to her, but in the course of the conversation and some of the discussion that happened in Senate finance over the last week or two, the whole idea of funding a, a manager and executive director for CB5, uh, for the CUDS came up. And in the course of the conversation, I said, do you have, you know, when the regional commission is being you know, quite active in the CUDS in Southern Vermont, you have not been very active here and not that you need to have a role in it, but it'd be interesting to see what kind of, you know, relationship we could have with the regional planning commission. And then that led into discussion that she has office space and that they have typically, they have typically let, they can actually do payroll for another organization. Um, so I said, oh, this is all kind of interesting. So I just thought I'd let everybody know that's not, and, and a mailing address that's in Montpelier, whether for good or for bad. Um, so that was good. And then she said also they'd be willing to help do a grant writing. So it's a really great conversation and um, need to follow up with her. And she said more than, and she's really happy to give us um, a lot of recommendation for our proposal. And she also mentioned that she had been talking to the guy at the Central Vermont Economic Development Corporation, whatever his name is. What's his name? Jamie Stewart. Stewart. And there's a lot of money out of EDA coming out in the next two years, like a lot of money. She said, it's pretty loosey goosey in terms of what you can fund. And, but they were thinking there was a big opportunity for Central Vermont in using that kind of money to do projects. And she was encouraging us to look at that. And I said, well, how much paperwork do they require? And she says, well, if you thought USDA was a lot of paperwork, <laughs> EDA has more. I said, uh, well, let's talk about it later. Anyway, so I was encouraged there with that conversation about, you know, finding some resources to help us, and maybe also finding some money to, to move things more administratively for us. So, so David, I heard the words executive director. What, was there any expansion on that discussion? Well, I don't know, the, the you know, this is all spurred on by Andy. <laughs> Good. And, and Andy put a great letter to the committee. Uh, this, was a Senate or House? It was the House Energy and Technology Committee. And so there was some really good discussion about, yeah, you can't run these things on a shoestring. And the department was pretty much agreeing with that. And then today, I didn't hear them exactly say they were going to provide money to help CUDS work. But it seems to me you can't you can't expect to spend money, uh, that kind of money without providing money to operate. So I don't know, there was well, not, no pleading on committals. Well, no, it was, it was in the proposal. It's number three, number three A, provide wow. direct support to communications union districts through the state's broadband innovation grant program for administrative and grant writing support. That was, they, they put that in there at that, mm -hmm. at that request that we made. So thank you, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> It was the white puppy dog that wrote the letter. Yeah. <laughs> At least he didn't throw it across the room. No, oh, jeez. Yeah. No standing. No standing. It's good. All right. Okay. So, um, all right. So I'm seeing a round table on the agenda next. Uh, David, you want to anything else? You kind of had the, the round table there. I'm done. <laughs> You're done? All right. Um, uh, Alan Gilbert, anything? You'd like to add? No, I'm good. Thanks. Good meeting. All right, Andy. Uh, I'm I'm pretty good. I, I I'm still a little. I'll wait till we see the feasibility study. Yeah, I'm good. Okay, Chuck. I'm all set. Thank you, everyone. Sure, Frank. I'm good. Um, like Andy, waiting for the feasibility study. All righty, Greg. Yeah, I'm good. Okay, Jared. Uh, nothing to add. Thanks. Okie dokie. Jeremy. 
I just thanks everyone for your work and really hope that we can get fiber to my house very soon. <laughs> Jeremy, I have your... a question. Yeah, go for it. Are we limited to six webcams on this form of GoToMeeting? Because every time I tried to activate my webcam, it said we were already at our maximum. Yeah, oh. same here. Yep. Oh, I had no idea. I yeah, wanted you all to see my pretty face. Okay. There's, there's, oh, just let me on. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Well, I will. I will look at this at the settings, and we'll see if we can do this better. Um, better next time, or maybe if I do this as I go to meeting and just lock it down, maybe that will work better. And I go to webinar. The reason I do that is it sort of um, d defends against the Zoom bombing garbage where. People who you don't know can essentially seize the uh, seize the meeting. Apparently, that's been but, uh, corrected with new versions. Uh, yeah, except I was on the Duxbury Select Board meeting last night. They did not have it set up right. Somebody accidentally, oh. you know, shared their desktop, and they were looking through their Gmail, and it took them about a minute to tell the guy, "We don't need to see your emails." <laughs> Lucky that's all it was. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, that is exactly right. That would be. Horribly embarrassing. All right, um, Jerry. Nothing more for me, thank you all. All right, John Russell. Uh, good meeting, I have nothing to add. All right, thanks, John. Uh, Jonathan. Dearly departed, Jonathan. Already departed? No, he's still here. He just unmuted. He's disconnected. Sorry. Okay. All right. So, uh, Josh? Uh, no, I just wanted to say thank you for everyone's uh, hard work that, they, that they've put in, and I'm really looking forward to the uh, final feasibility study, and I uh, can't wait to start moving forward. Thank you. All right. Ken? Yeah, I'm going to be a bit of a wet blanket. Um, I'm really concerned about all the emergency actions that are going on with a particular subset about the fixed wireless discussions and you know establishing these emergency connections and if 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 indeed next September our kids don't go back to school there will be a very very significant push to provide them connections and it's not going to be through fiber um and so I, I I'm concerned about that um it, it's going to cut, in, and also I'm, you know, pretty strong believer we're going to see a very, very significant economic challenge as a result of of the high, very, you know, twenty percent, twenty five percent unemployment. So, anyway, I, I, I don't know the path, but again, I just want to express my pretty deep concern um, that I'm not sure where the fixed wireless fits into any of these discussions. And then, then the other, the po positive of that also is they, you know, they put there as a separate number on today's proposal, but it's the mobile wireless, which again could use some of the same infrastructure that we're talking about in terms of um, providing service along roads, and that could be a revenue stream. So I just, I, I, I want more, more of the thinking to take place, and largely it's the state, it's not our responsibility, but I need more of that thinking to take place so that we, as we move forward, we have a much more certain terrain that we're working under, rather than, you know, stringing up a lot of fiber and then finding a lot of poor folks that can't subscribe and they're served by other folks. Okay, Ken, is, is this something that um, you're concerned about the fixed wireless? Um, is this something that we could piggyback in that letter that I'm putting together? Would you be able, willing to put some notes together that I can kind of tack in there? Because that's something that's going to impact not just us here in Central Vermont, certainly folks elsewhere as well. I can try. Yeah, I'll, I'll send language and I'll leave it to you to, yeah. to see if I, it can weave in. Yeah, I mean, you know, even if there's kind of some bullet points of where there's the most important things that we need to make sure we mention, even if it's not fully full-blown narrative, I'm reasonably good at you know, spinning that out and incorporating it. So, but I would, I would love to have your concerns addressed in that because I, I think, um, I think in terms of DPS is that they're probably not 
police seeing that. And while these, this letter is not to them necessarily, they're definitely going to be reading it. Okay, do my best. Thank you, Ken. Michael? I share Ken's concerns. Um, as, as a matter of fact, right now, um, June Tierney and Velko and others are urging emergency wisps to be built right away. And now they're proposing fiber everywhere instead. And I'm, it's curious. Um, I'm working with another wisp to build something in the eastern part of the Northeast Kingdom um, from Burke down to Concord and Lunenburg. A whole new wisp. And it's at their instigation. And yet today in the meeting, they never mentioned fixed wireless at all, but they they understood that fixed wireless is the quickest way to get a lot of people good service. So I I agree with Ken that, that and, and especially in the context that, so this is an aspirational thing, 293 million or less for fiber all over the place. I can't imagine Phil Scott releasing all of that. I can imagine possibly getting it from broadband infrastructure bill, but who knows what restrictions will be on that. It's possible that the only way we serve everybody is a mixture. And that's why we've always been looking at that. That's why Fred is studying that. And to just leave fixed wireless out is, is risky. So I really agree with what Ken said. So on the, on the same, on the same note to Ken, then, if there are things related to that that you would like to see in the multi-CUD letter, um, please, you know, please forward that to me. The next 24 hours would be ideal because I expect to be fin finishing my edits to that by tomorrow noon or one, probably. And just to throw in, uh, Evan Carlson is very much behind this project that we're trying to put together. So. That's interesting too. It sure is. There's a lot, a lot of moving parts here, obviously. All right, uh, Phil. Um, I'm I'm excited to hear about all the the different possibilities uh, for additional funding. Some of it we might be able to access, although I, I think you know there's a lot more for us to know as we move forward. I'm anxious to see that final feasibility study and then think about moving on to the to the business plan. But uh, and again, David, you know, thanks again for all of your work and good meeting. Thanks, Phil. Uh, Ray. So I don't think financial sustainability is going to be the barrier. I think there's going to be a lot of grant money. I think the sooner we can get to engineering, the sooner we can get to a scalable, the sooner we can be shovel ready, we're going to get the money. And if we can get to engineering as quickly as possible, because that's the money's gonna start flowing then. This Again, I don't think that uh, financial um, sustainability is going to be the issue. We, we're going to get there, but uh, they're gonna give us millions of dollars of grant money. Plan for it. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, Ray. Uh, Tom? Uh, echo Ray's thoughts there. Um, also, I had a, an interesting email come through work uh, yesterday uh, from, I work for Efficiency Vermont, um, and the director of emerging technologies kind of reached out and said that they're going to be meeting with the state this week to talk about broadband connectivity issues in Vermont and how Efficiency Vermont can aid in that. Um, and of course, the connection is not an immediately obvious one. And so she was kind of reaching out to me and saying, okay, so what are your thoughts on this? Um, and I thought I would just throw it out to solicit the group here and see if anybody has any immediate thoughts. Um, some of the initial thoughts I had were um, that there was in the feasibility study a comment about uh, how home run lines are less energy efficient than the, you know, the PON um, structure. I didn't know how much energy is involved there or if that's, you know, not much. Um, but then also I know that uh, we do a lot of like weatherization programs and, and uh, smart thermostats, uh, flexible load management work and that sort of thing. 
uh, fleet management, all that, it requires, you know, connectivity to work. And so I was suggesting maybe we could look at, you know, how could we incentivize some of the connections to faster internet speeds as being part of the incentive programs we roll out. It's just kind of an idea to throw out. Um, I just want to yeah. throw that up to the group and see if any other thoughts. Yeah, this is Ken. So it is another one of the topics. I, I work on rate design with the public service department. And it is so it is very clear that both heat pumps and electric vehicle charging stations require communication with the grid so that their utilization doesn't lead to extreme peaks. I mean, if it, they, they look at models and now the way electric vehicles, if, if run by default, people will charge them at home when they get home and that's exactly the wrong time. So they need to be internet connected. And so this has been a topic to make sure that homes for those particular appliances, uh, heat pumps and electric vehicle charging, um, make sure they have su sufficient internet connections so that the utility can communicate and not lead us to real significant um, peak issues. It, it, the House Energy and Technology Committee, if you haven't talked to Brian Otley from Green Mountain Power, he has a great line of thought about why utilities need to be doing fiber to every house to manage the load. So he is, I, I've known him for a long time. He's a very smart person. And I'm sure Efficiency Vermont has probably dealt with him in the past. He was really towing a great line about, he was talking about energy justice as well, which I thought was an interesting comment to come from somebody in a utility. D David, would you put Tom in touch with him? Like do like an introduction. Yep. yep. Cool. Thank you. Anything else, Tom? No, that was fine. Really, if anybody has any other ideas that come through, uh, feel free to send me an email. I'll pass them along. Great. Thank you very much. All right, Trev, our new our new board member. Any uh, any thoughts or last uh, last additions? No, uh, good meeting so far. Appreciate it. Uh, echo a lot of folks. Um, comments, Phil, Ray, et cetera, with regards to the revenue streams and um, wanting to see the feasibility status. And again, I got some catch up to do here. So thank you. That sounds good. All right. Uh, I don't have uh, anything else really to add. Uh, thanks all for uh, entertaining this uh, additional meeting two weeks after we had the previous one. And I guess we will we'll see you all again in two weeks then. Thank you, everyone. That's yeah. good. Thanks. good. Thanks. See you then. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.